you cover technology, you know so much about technology, and that was a crucial part to how Jared Kushner helped his father-in-law win here, was technology. They had the sit-down you write about, yeah. and Donald Trump says, hey, can Jared, Jared, who you say, by the way, was been, been on Twitter since 2009 and never tweeted. Never tweeted, very private, very Father-in-law says, okay, I want you to run my Facebook. And yeah. from there, it took off. Took off. They're having um, McDonald's egg uh, filet of fishes on the private jet and saying, take, oh, take this over. And Jared is in real estate, but he invests in a lot of tech companies, so he knows people like Peter Thiel, his brother Josh is a very formidable venture capitalist. He made all these phone calls, talked to the best marketers around, and he treated Trump like an e-commerce company, like a consumer tech company. All you do is you want to get attention and you want to get eyeballs and you want to get voters. That's what he did. So he had, what, $8,000 a day they were getting on hats, and he managed to turn that to $80,000. Yeah, just doing simple targeting. Like, Trump was a very unique... We never had a, a, um, a candidate like him. So they used targeting. They found a way to get people on Facebook and Twitter. They were going from $8,000 a day selling hats and stickers on the site to 80000 a day. And that gave them money to help run the marketing. But also, it turned all these people into walking Trump billboards wearing all the gear. So that was just one thing. Then they evolved into this 100-person secret data center down in San Antonio. And they had data do everything. Data determined his schedule, his rallies, even what he spoke about in the rallies. So they knew. Even what he spoke about at the rallies. Yes. So to us, it seems like, oh, here he goes. We know we're used to this cul-de-sac or that. Yep. You're saying this was driven by a team of 100 people in a secret warehouse. Yep, and they tweak the speeches, and then they use TV. Instead of just saying, like, oh, I want to buy, you know, 100 points in Philadelphia, they say, we know that people that watch NCIS or care about Obamacare, let's run a commercial for that. And they found a way to kind of micro-target television. Wow. I mean, it's just because it's amazing because, yeah. you know, keep hearing that there, there wasn't a lot of planning here. But you're saying Jared was at the center of it. There was a lot. And, and in the interview, uh, you talk about, uh, you know, you say when you talk to Jared, he said um, he was uh, people knew they could trust him, that he wasn't going to leak. Yes. What was he like in person when you speak to him? Because as I say, he keeps a no profile. What was he like in person? He's really polite and he's just he's obsessively polite and guarded. Doesn't mean he's quiet. He's very personable, but he's controlled. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions. He's a paradox. Everything with him being, you know, an Orthodox Jewish, then supporting someone who has some alt-right followers. The fact that he comes from a prolific Democrat family and he's running a Republican campaign. And I asked him all these questions, even about if he, you know, kind of put the axe in Chris Christie. He never lost his cool, and he just gave a very thoughtful, not, not programmed, but a thoughtful answer to each one of those questions in the story. In terms of the alt-right, before we go, though, you sure. say um, that, that his Judaism was very important yes. in his office, right there. On display. That's the first thing you see. Is it's you know there's books, there's symbols. I mean, it's just he's, it's he's he keeps um, Shabbos and everything, so he's, it's part of his life, and it's very apparent. Opposed to Trump, when you go in, it's all the ego of Trump. His uh, Jared's walls are very just um, very sparse, and you can see that he's a man of faith. The decision not to go after Clinton. Do you think that any of his support base should feel duped? Uh, that he was so strong on this that this is definitely going to happen. It gave a lot of people confidence that Donald Trump would be different, that he'd go after people who they perceived as corrupt largely at Donald Trump's urging. And now he says, she suffered enough. I'm okay with that. Should people feel duped? Well, I would and if not, why not? I don't know, duped, but I think there's a, a, a lot of people on the right who, if he starts to move, as you've reported throughout this morning, on a number of different positions, they're going to be frustrated, and that frustration will turn into anger. In regard to Hillary Clinton, Chris, I think that it's important to note there's, there's two different investigations. One is the emails in the private server. Uh, Director Comey from the FBI has investigated that. Uh, the Department of Justice said they're not going to prosecute it. And I think you have to let that dog lie. Let it go. I don't think it's appropriate that Mr. Trump come into the presidency and, and demand that that investigation be reopened. Today, Donald Trump met face to face with one of his favorite targets, the New York Times. And the newspaper's reporters were live tweeting the highlights. <laughs> to all of his supporters calling for Hillary Clinton to be jailed over her emails in the Clinton Foundation, Trump hinted he's leaning against pushing for any sort of prosecution saying it would be very, very divisive for the country. It's a reversal for Trump, who shattered presidential campaign norms by threatening to imprison his opponent repeatedly. I am going to instruct my attorney general to get a special prosecutor to look into your situation, because there has never been so many lies, so much deception. On his chief strategist, Steve Bannon, who's been accused of showcasing racist views on his Breitbart news site, Trump said it's very hard on Bannon. I think he's having a hard time with it because it's not him. 
And Trump even moderated his stance on global warming, which he once called a hoax, telling the Times, I think there is some connectivity between humans and climate change. With his inauguration getting closer, the president-elect has no shortage of flames to put out. From a new revelation in the Washington Post that the Trump Foundation admitted to the IRS it was engaged in self-dealing and illegally misusing charitable donations to the mounting conflicts posed by his business affairs overseas. Trump told the Times, in theory, I could run my business perfectly and then run the country perfectly. There's never been a case like this. We are facing another ism, just like we face Nazism. And there are new questions about Michael Flynn, who's tapped to be Trump's national security advisor after the retired general's comments on Islamism last August. This is Islamism, and it, and it, is, a, it is a vicious cancer inside the body of 1.7 billion people on this planet, and it has to be excised. Trump has mostly tried to bypass the media since his election, revealing his upcoming agenda in this transition-produced video. My agenda will be based on a simple core principle, putting America first. A top supporter's message to the press, get used to it. But, you know, Donald Trump's going to, you know, make his own way with the press, and he's probably going to do a lot of those videos, I would imagine. Sure. Where it's straight to the American people, go around yeah, the right. press. That's right. It is um, a, a kind of diffuse, loose network of, of people, you know. But, I, you know, I don't think it's, it's an overstatement to say that in, in you know, many ways, the, one way of understanding it is kind of good old-fashioned white supremacy dressed up and married to a kind of new anti-globalism. And that's what gives it its complexity, um, that, that there's kind of both of these things going on at the same time. Yeah, well, again, I guess, you know, context is always important, and we have seen the images, we're watching them now, uh, the Nazi salutes, uh, praise of Trump at the same time, and so on. Uh, they are disturbing, but do you think they are getting, uh, I don't know, outsized attention at the moment. Do you think this group is worthy of the coverage they're getting uh, uh, you know, relative to their size? You know, it's an important question. On the one hand, it was, you know, a couple of hundred people in Washington, D.C., but they were at the Ronald Reagan building in Washington, you know, D.C. And, you know, in addition to the video you showed, we saw this, them saying America was until this past generation a white country designed for ourselves and our posterity. It's our creation. It's our inheritance. It belongs to us, like very clearly uh, here. But, you know, if it were only that, I think, you know, we could dismiss it. But what we're seeing is, you know, the Southern Poverty Law Center has documented over 700 cases of harassment or intimidation in the week after the election. Just here in my hometown, of where I live now in Silver Spring, Maryland, we've seen an Episcopal church that had Spanish services uh, you know, offered was slashed, and on the back of it, it wrote Trump Nation, whites only. You know, so if it were only kind of a, you know, a handful of uh, people on the fringe, that would be one thing. But we are seeing kind of an emboldened set of grassroots people all over the country. And I think what's most disturbing is that there is this kind of direct link uh, between, you know, Breitbart.com, which, as Steve Bannon himself said, was a platform uh, for the alt-right who is now at the right hand of, of Donald Trump. And you know, in the press release announcing, uh, he was one of the earliest advisors announced to Trump as the chief strategist, along with Reince Priebus uh, as chief of staff. And when that, that press release went out, actually Bannon's name was listed before uh, uh, Priebus's name. You, you, that gives you some idea of the importance. Yeah, you, you stole my next question. I mean, you, the, the appointment of Steve Bannon, this is a man who, who proudly says he gave a platform to the alt-right at, at the Breitbart website. When you see him in a position of, considerable power in the Trump administration. What, what do you think? Well, I mean, we've never seen anything like it. I mean, I think it is just important to say that, that someone who is just overtly on the record, um, you know, said, um, you know, that he's platformed the alt-right. Um, he's on the record saying that it's a laudable political strategy to let the, to let the grassroots, quote, turn on the hate as a political tool of getting uh, politicians to sort of move the way that he wants them to move. I mean, this is an incredibly dangerous thing, I think, for someone who has the ear of the president. Yeah, and, and he's a man who also uh, said, you know, well, if the Republican Party doesn't like it, let's take it over. Do you think the Republican Party, uh, inadvertently or not, gave, gave power to this um, element of American society by playing to the fears of whites in America, particularly older white males, encouraging them to feel threatened uh, by a changing America. Does the party itself bear some responsibility? Well, you know, one of the things that I, I sort of studied in my book was this kind of long trend that we're seeing. And, you know, it is true that we are experiencing unprecedented change, both economic, cultural, and demographic in the country that is, you know, creating this atmosphere 
um, in the country, you know, but we're we're reaping some of the consequences really of some long term political strategies, including the southern strategy uh, that really began, uh, you know, in the 1970s. Uh, as a Republican Party tried to peel away white Southern Christians uh, from the Democratic Party and did this largely successfully. Uh, and what that's meant is that the two parties have become very, um, one party has become very homogeneous, a kind of white Christian party, uh, the Republican Party, and the other party has become sort of very diverse. And this creates some really dysfunctional dynamics uh, for, for a democracy that really, you know, hopes that a presidential election will bring forth a candidate that could be a president for everyone. And, and just quickly, will, will demographics be beat the alt-right? I mean, you know, as they say, it's basically a white group. The, the, the odds aren't on their side when it comes to how America is changing. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, the you know what I, I really do see this election in, in many ways is kind of a last gasp of a kind of shrinking pool, uh, particularly of white Christian voters in the country that have this kind of white Anglo-Saxon identity, um, you know, at the at the heart of um, kind of what they're voting for. Um, but the but the numbers are shrinking. There's no doubt uh, about it. Um, you know, this this election looks like around 55 percent of the electorate was white and Christian. But by 2024, um, that'll be the first election where at the ballot box um, we've already crossed that way in the general population, but even even at the ballot box, uh, we'll see a minority of the country who are white and Christian. Protecting President-elect Donald Trump is a challenge unlike any other, from Trump Tower in New York to his private club in Florida. So we're approaching Mar-a-Lago right here. It's a 20-acre waterfront estate in Palm Beach, secluded from the public, but he also shares it with as many as 500 members who are willing to pay $100,000 to join. Basically, it's a compound, and we have to treat it as such. Former Secret Service and ATF Special Agent Rennie Rodriguez says in many ways it's ready-made for presidential security. Behind this natural barrier here, which I assume there's a fence. Yeah, there's it appears a, there's, there's a wall back there's there. There's a wall, a tall wall. It's, yeah, it's more than, than, uh, than 13 feet, I believe, which is great for, uh, for deterring anyone trying to come on the premises. Behind the wall, Trump keeps a residence that could become the Winter White House. And I love Florida, this is my second home. Where presidents spend their vacations is a window into their personalities. George W. Bush Fox liked to spend here, the hottest month of, of the birds. year on his ranch in Crawford, Texas. Is, this is a wonderful spot to come up in here and just kinda think about the budget. I mean, <laughs> that is <laughs> George Bush Sr. famously enjoyed the peaceful serenity of Kenny Bunkport, Maine. Mar-a-Lago stretches across a barrier island, cut down the middle by a two-lane road, nestled between a stunning stream of multi-million dollar homes. The best view comes from across the bay. Rodriguez says Secret Service teams are assessing threats that could come by land, sea, and air. And standing outside the club, it doesn't take long to see the skies above will be a major concern. I mean, that, that plane's, what, maybe a, a couple thousand feet over us? The Palm Beach International Airport is just a few miles west of Mar-a-Lago. You can see the, uh, the, the path for commercial aircraft. For years, Trump has waged a legal battle to keep commercial and private planes from flying over this estate. And now that he's president-elect, he might have just gotten his way. When he's on the property, Rodriguez says, the airspace really over Mar-a-Lago will be closed. This would be a type of aircraft that an individual uh, would use to drive his plane into on the property. And in the waters around Mar-a-Lago, the U.S. Coast Guard is already setting up security zones, some parts completely off limits, other areas that require permission before entering. Rodriguez says Secret Service agents will also conduct renewed background checks on every club member. And inside the club, they can also expect to see new levels of visible and invisible layers of security. But life's going to change around here for the next four years. Yes, it will, most definitely.